Well, good morning and welcome to Western Springs Baptist Church to our online service. We are so glad that you could join us here this morning. Even though this is unexpected that we're online only, we know that God is faithful and good and God is present in our homes. Our call to worship this morning is found in Psalm 25. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Savior. And my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. Please worship with us this morning. another phase of this COVID time uh, just to let you know as a congregation that as the virus is spreading around it's circling a little closer to us as a church family and so we have decided that uh, we will for a couple of weeks just suspend in-person services we know that someone was here last week now has been tested positive I think that for you as a congregation, you're pretty safe. More likely for some of us as a staff, we might have been exposed. So that's why we've said, maybe better if you stay home for this week. And then we've also decided to do it next week as well. So for these two Sundays, uh, we, we wrestle with this uh, desire to meet and, and the value of that. And we wanna press on toward that. We want to meet together but also the responsibility to protect and to not spread the disease especially. So, so that's where we're at. 
so for this week and next week, we're going to have no in-person services. We will stream online uh, the same way and uh, trust that uh, honoring that 14 days of kind of quarantining a little bit as a congregation that we'll be able to meet again then in person on the 6th of December. That's the plan. You will help us if you've been here and you get sick or test positive for COVID-19, uh, we will keep it confidential. But if you could let us know, that would help us to know how to make decisions going forward. And we trust that uh, we'll be able to meet again. A couple of things this means, however, and first is there will be no in-person Thanksgiving service as well. Um, we're disappointed about that. There will be a, a loss, especially for us who've come year after year. I'm going to be preparing a, a video some, uh, similar to the meditation videos I've sent out, maybe a little longer, that you can have for Thanksgiving Day or around this week. So uh, I encourage you to watch that and uh, have some time as a family in Thanksgiving. We have much to be thankful for, and we want to do that during this time as well. The other thing is when we meet next week in your homes online, we're going to have a communion as part of that. So I'm encouraging you to think about having some communion elements so that you would be ready at home to share with us in communion. That'll be next, or next week. Now, I know that that's the last Sunday of the month. I think you can adjust. Uh, we're, we're just planning it for next week. And, and, then, and then when we're back in, in session on the 6th, and we hope that we'll be able to do that, uh, there'll be special music that'll uh, be part of it because we'll be well into Advent by then. So that's the exciting times coming forward. So would you keep our congregation in your prayers and that uh, we will stay healthy and that God will bless. In fact, let me just pray right now for us as a congregation. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we can trust you in times of need. And as uh, we live in these days where there's disease around us, Lord, we ask for your protection, but we also ask for your courage. And we pray that your people would be able to trust you and that we would be able to walk with you during these days. For those who may be sick, Lord, would you bring healing? Would you uh, protect them? And I pray, especially this week, that, that we will enjoy... Um, Time just thinking of all of the blessings that we have and giving you praise and thanksgiving for all that you've done. So we ask that you'd help us during these days. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. We'll continue to worship. My Savior leads me. Who have I to ask besides? How could I doubt His tender mercy? Who through life has been my guide? All the way my Savior leads me. Cheers each wide path I tread. He gives me grace for every trial. Feeds me with the divine bread. You lead me and keep me from falling. You close to your heart and surely your goodness and mercy will follow me all the way my Savior leads me oh the fullness of Being 
sings his flock to realms of day. This my song through endless ages. Yes, Jesus led me off. Thank you, Steve and Josh, for reminding us of that wonderful truth today. Come with me to the Word of God this morning. Again, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 55. We, we come to the end of this brief series that we've done out of the book of Isaiah and called, uh, entitled God, Our Help. Uh, it's hard to believe, but next week already begins Advent. We're moving into a new series that will also come from the prophets uh, entitled Longing for Christmas. Uh, and we'll look at a text from Isaiah and then Zechariah, Zephaniah, Jeremiah. So those Old Testament prophets as we look at their sense of longing that they had for what the, the hope would be when Christ would come. So that will be next week. This morning, Isaiah 55, I'd like to read the text. Come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you'll delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and a commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel." For he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth... So are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not turn 
return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I have sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper, and instead of briars the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. Let me pray. Father, thank you for these encouraging words that remind us that you are there to meet all of our needs, to bring us joy and satisfaction and peace in a troubled world. Help us to come to you this morning. Help us to call upon you. Help us to respond to this text, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a lot of disappointment in our world. I think especially now. Some of you have experienced that. Trips canceled. Events that have been called off. And important events. Things like graduations. Things like that. Gatherings that have now just been virtual and, and not in person. And it's not quite the same. You know, on Friday I, I sat in the office and, and Karen and I put together the the email that went out to you that said we are not going to worship today and it was with a profound sense of disappointment in fact when I got home and I saw it up on Sherilyn's computer I just almost had to fight back tears the disappointment of not being together it's the world in which we live isn't it unfulfilled longings unmet expectations and and with that comes that sense of emptiness we feel I think during COVID time maybe we're feeling it more than ever but we live in a fallen world full of disappointment. You know, if you're a sports fan, you live with that, especially here in Chicago, frankly. <laughs> Can I tell you that uh, I went to bed early on Monday night. I was watching the Bears with hopefulness, and it got to that fourth quarter. Uh, they were behind now by six points. And I think for the fourth or fifth time in a row, it was three plays and a punt. And I said, this is not going to end well. I don't want to be more disappointment, disappointed. And I went to bed. And I learned the next morning, glad I did. Disappointment. We feel it, don't we? I think of the career goals that one has young in life and you pursue them and you think you're going to be a big success and, and in the middle of it all you find you're pretty ordinary and, and disappointment comes in and it may be a disappointing job that doesn't give you much satisfaction anymore. Or, or maybe it's uh, you, you put your energy into raising your family and, and now your children are disappointing you. Or you've gathered wealth and, and bought the things that wealth brings, and now those things are very empty for you. Or maybe you've pursued fame, and, and there are a few who get it, and when they find it, it is empty for them as well. Christopher Parkening is considered to be the world's greatest classical guitarist, and he achieved his musical dreams by the age of 30. It's interesting, by that time he was also a world-class fly fishing champion. However, his success failed to bring him happiness. And weary of performances and recording sessions, Parkening bought a ranch and gave up his guitar. But instead of finding happiness, after getting away from it all as he, his life became even more meaningless. And he wrote, if you arrive at a point in your life where you have everything that you've ever wanted and thought that would make you happy and it still doesn't, then you start questioning things. It's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I had that. And I thought, well, what's left? The emptiness and the disappointment that comes. Well, for Christopher Parkening, the story doesn't end there. While visiting friends, he attended church with them, and he heard the gospel, and he put his faith in Christ. And Parkening developed a hunger for Scripture and was struck by 1 Corinthians 10, 31, which says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. He explains, I realized that there were only two things I knew how to do, fly fish for trout and play the guitar. Well, I'm playing the guitar again today, 
absolutely by the grace of God and for his glory. I have a joy, a peace, and a deep down fulfillment in, a li in my life I never had before. My life has purpose. I've learned firsthand the secret of true happiness. I think for Christopher Parkening, I would say he found bread for his soul and learned that satisfaction only comes from God. Isaiah the prophet is concerned about the souls of people. He asks the very stark question in verse 2. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Why are you chasing after all of these things that can never bring you satisfaction? Frank Farrell says it this way. It is my conviction that a very large part of mankind's ills and the world's misery is due to the rampant practice of trying to feed the soul with the body's food. And it leaves us empty, concerned about food for the table. We're not satisfied. Our souls are empty, and we live in a world of disappoint disappointment. Only bread for the soul truly satisfies. And so Isaiah the prophet brings this invitation from God to us. It is an invitation to come and partake of the salvation that the Lord offers that can only bring satisfaction. And for us, it is quite clear as we look at the scriptures, the context here in all of the Bible, that this offer comes to us through Christ. I say that because of the context here in Isaiah. Step back just two chapters to Isaiah 53 clearly from the New Testament, speaking about Jesus. Verse 4, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. We considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He is our Redeemer, the one that brings us life. And when we get to chapter 54, again, the blessing of that is spelled out. The blessing of our Redeemer, verse 5, For your Maker is your husband, the Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called God of all the earth. The end of verse 8, But with everlasting kindness I will have compassion on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. And verse 10, Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. The blessings of this relationship with God, the salvation he gives. So when we get to chapter 55, he simply gives this invitation, come, come. Receive the blessing that I want to give to your soul. And as we look at the Bible, we learn that a life devoted to the things of this world will always disappoint, but a life devoted to Christ will bring satisfaction. Or as Isaiah's text says, we will be satisfied as with the richest of fare. Now notice as we go through this chapter that first of all, God gives the satisfaction of a soul that is fed, verses 1 through 5. We have a deep spiritual need for spiritual food. And when he uses the words water, wine, milk, and bread, I think they are figures of spiritual blessings that he wishes to give us. Equating it with the, the basic need we have. Now we know we have a physical need for food. That's very apparent to us. A basic need we have. In fact, my family has learned that when I am hungry, I get irritable. They know that well. I'm guessing that's true for all of us. But I'm wondering, even though I may not know it, if when I am hungry spiritually, I get irritable as well and, and, and a bit crabby. And so the invitation, it, it's almost like the image of a street vendor who says, come, come and get the sustenance you need. In the arid world, come for this water. And he is saying, this is a basic need you have. But notice also, it often is an unperceived need. I think of that story of Jesus as he's outside the town of Sychar in Samaria. And a woman comes out to get water. She knows she has this need for physical water. But Jesus says to her, verse 13, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. 
But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus says, there's a greater thirst than your physical thirst. And you don't even know it. Come to me and you'll receive the blessing. I think there's a basic difference between spiritual hunger and physical hunger. With physical hunger, when you miss a meal, your longing for the next one grows and you'll not miss the next one. With spiritual hunger, if you miss a meal, you'll lose your appetite for it and you'll be less likely to long for the next meal. And for many of us, this basic need becomes an unperceived need. And therefore, it becomes an unmet need. Notice in this text, no money with which to buy it. They couldn't get it if they wanted to. And all of our labors will not bring satisfaction if we rely on ourselves. Brian Wilkerson tells a story about taking his family to one of these themed restaurants. And he said in this restaurant there were TVs all over on each of the walls. And they were playing cartoons with no sound. And he says our youngest son who was about four at the time had his eyes glued to the TV screen. And he was watching a continuous loop of Roadrunner cartoons, watching as Wile E. Coyote strapped on rocket-propelled roller skates or shot himself out of a cannon or launched himself from a giant slingshot in pursuit of that elusive Roadrunner. And after watching intently for a long time, this little boy had an epiphany. Without taking his eyes off the screen, he had quietly announced to the family, no matter what he does, He's never going to get the chicken. (laughs) It's exactly what every human being has experienced since the time of Adam. Pursuing after the forbidden fruit out there, no matter what we do, we never get the reward. It's the result of sin. We have a deep need for spiritual food. But notice that God offers this blessing of spiritual food. It's offered by grace. It's it's an interesting note in the text. Come by without money or cost. It's like going to the farmer's market and you go to the booth and there's all of the fruits and vegetables for you and it's free. Just come and take it. Well, how can it be free? Well, it's already been purchased, already been bought by our Savior through His grace to us. Remember the acronym God's Riches at Christ's expense. I think it is what grace is. Maybe grace is more than that, but it is that. God's riches at Christ's expense. It's offered to us by grace. Notice it's offered in abundance. Water and bread, I think, speak of the the very things that sustain life, or or maybe life itself, but it goes beyond that. It's not only water and bread. It's it's milk and wine, the enjoyment, the the nourishment, or as, as some have called it, the the, the, the human flourishing that, that goes far beyond that our soul will be delighted in the richest affair. All of the things that we pursue after in this world do not bring human flourishing. They don't bring the joy and the hope and the peace that comes when in a, we come to our Lord and he gives us in, abundant, in abundance. Now notice also that it's offered through Christ, verses 3 and 4. He says, it's like the promise to David, that that covenant I made with him, the the faithful love promised to him. We begin to experience that, and and I believe that as we go on into verse 4, it's through the Messiah, the greater David, and that when he uses the word uh, him in verse 4, I have made him a witness to the peoples, that is Christ himself, as, as fulfilling the promise to David from the Old Testament. I say that because he is the one who is the witness. Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the one who witnesses to the the truth. And in, in John 18, as he is interacting with Pilate, Jesus says this, in fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. He's that witness to the truth. And when he came into this world, he showed us what God is like, and especially when he came to die on the cross for us. And he is the ruler, the the prophet, the leader. He is the commander. He is the king. And he is the one now who has come 
to all nations to draw them to himself so that we become one great people of God, the church of Christ, now attracted to the glorified Christ. God offers the blessing of this spiritual food by grace in abundance through Christ. But notice we must receive the blessing of spiritual food. He, he says, listen, emphatically, listen to me. Pay attention to me. You must hear what I have to say. It's so easy to listen to everyone else and to be drawn to the things of this world. He says, now listen. And then he says, come to me. I think it parallels that invitation from Jesus in Matthew 11. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There's the invitation. Come. Only when we come to him and receive the, the blessing that he gives us is our soul satisfied by being fed on that spiritual food. But notice, secondly in the text, that God gives the satisfaction of sins that are forgiven, verses nine through, uh, 6 through 9. Why are we hungry? Well, sin has separated us from God, and there's, there's this desire we have after God because that's how we've been created, and, and it cannot be fulfilled. Ogden Nash said this, there is only one way to achieve happiness on this terrestrial ball, and that is either to have a clear conscience or none at all. Now, the truth is that we all have a conscience, and if we will examine it, it is not clear. There are sins that have come in and separated us from God. But verse 6 gives us the remedy. Seek the Lord, call upon him. This response of faith and repentance is what brings forgiveness. And as we look at these verses, there's a three-step process. I'm not so sure it's a necessarily a, a, a process through time as a logical process. First, turn away from evil. The wicked are to forsake their ways, the unrighteous their thoughts. Man's ways and man's thoughts, his ways, the, the course of life, that aimless, meandering, disappointing, and even evil course of life because it moves us away from God. Man's ways, man's thoughts, the, the designs and purposes that fill our minds, that stubborn resistance against God that says, I will do my own thing, and that misguided sense of self-sufficiency, I can do it my own way. And it brings on us the heavy load, the burden of unconfessed and unforgiven sin. We must turn away from evil. That's the first step. And then secondly, turn to God. That is repentance, turning from evil, turning to God. Come by faith to Christ. Christian in Pilgrim's Progress comes to the cross, and it is there that the crushing burden is rolled from his shoulders, and that burden is gone. That's what happens when we come to God. And when we get there, we find that he is merciful, his pardon is free and abundant, and that is the, the good news that we experience as we come to him. Uh, a, a preacher and a barber were walking through some city slums, and the barber, who was not a believer, said, this is why I can't believe in your God of love. If he was as kind as you say, he wouldn't permit all this poverty, disease, and squalor. He wouldn't allow these poor street people to live the way they do. I cannot believe in a God who permits these things. The pastor was silent, and as they walked along, they met a man who was especially unkempt. His hair was hanging down his neck, and he had about a half-inch stubble on his face. And the preacher said to his barber friend, you can't be a good barber. Or you wouldn't permit a man like this to continue living here without a haircut and a shave. And indignant, the barber answered, why blame me for this man's condition? He has never come to my shop. Even if he had come to my shop, I would fix him up and make him look like a gentleman. And the preacher said, then don't blame God for allowing people to continue in their evil ways. He gives them an invitation to come and be saved. And they have not come. And I would say, as an aside, and the barber would have charged money for that haircut. And God says, come, receive it freely. Turn away from evil, turn to God. And then I, 
live according to God's ways, verses 8 and 9. You see, our ways must be forsaken and we must follow God's ways, His ways that are higher than our ways. And the emphasis is striking. Like the heaven is higher than the earth and, and we know that that's an infinite amount. It's incomprehensible. And, and I think of the New Testament concept of love that surpasses knowledge. We'll never understand it. That's the love that God has for us. And the good news is that, that he has given this to us. And so we can live in light of that, a righteous life, live according to his ways. And righteous living is not required for salvation, but it certainly is the result of salvation. And so we turn from evil, we turn to God, and then we can live according to God's ways. But notice... The transaction must happen. We must seek the Lord and call upon him. And, and now, not later. He says, while he may be found or while he is near, now is the day of salvation. And I would simply urge you to make that step of faith to Christ today. And then notice it is, it is, it is continuously. It's not only in the past. It, it's, it's God's salvation that is present for us. And when our sins are forgiven, we begin to experience the wonder of the blessings that God gives to us. God gives us the satisfaction of sins that are forgiven and the satisfaction of a soul that is fed. But notice also God gives the satisfaction of a heart that is filled. I think you, once you start on this pathway, you, you want to begin to get a taste after the spiritual food that he gives. You long for more. You long to be filled by it. Author Frederica Matthews Green addresses people who hunger for God's presence, but, but sometimes don't feel it, and at least not in dramatic ways. And she says this, she says, my hunch is that you are already sensing something of God's presence or you wouldn't care. And I'd say to you, you wouldn't be watching today. You'd, you'd be doing something else on a Sunday morning. Picture yourself walking around a shopping mall looking at people, she writes, and at the window displays. And suddenly you get a whiff of cinnamon. The craving isn't something you made up. There you were minding your own business when some drifting molecules of sugar, butter, and spice collided with a susceptible patch inside your nose. You had a real encounter with cinnamon, not a mental delusion, not an emotional projection, but the real thing. And what was the effect? You want more now. And if you hunger to know the presence of God this morning, it's because you have already begun to scent God's compelling delight. You've begun to taste the wonderful food that he gives. And God gives you then the satisfaction of a heart that is filled. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Now notice that a full heart comes from the word of God. It's the only way to understand God's thoughts and God's ways. Notice the nature of the word. It comes from God out of his mouth. God speaks. I'm reminded of 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The nature of God's word, he speaks and it is ours. But notice also the power of God's word. It accomplishes God's purposes. It will not return empty unto him. What are those purposes? Well, salvation is one, our spiritual growth, uh, the, the fruit bearing in our lives. God's word is powerful in our lives. It will bring transformation. I read about a university student, a Christian student, who shared a room with a Muslim university student. And as they became friends, uh, their conversation turned to their faiths. And the believer in Christ asked the Muslim if he'd ever read the Bible. And he answered no, but then he asked the Christian, have you ever read the Koran? And the believer responded, no, I haven't, but I think it would be interesting to do it. Why don't we read both books together, alternating weeks? You choose a section of the Koran, and we'll read that and discuss it. And then I'll choose a section of the Bible, and we'll read that and discuss it. And so they did that for a number of weeks as the, the Muslim man accepted the challenge. And their friendship deepened. And during the second semester of that year... The Muslim man put his faith in Christ. And then one evening late in the term, he burst into the room and shouted at the longtime believer, you deceived me. What are you talking about? The believer asked. 
Well, the new believer opened his Bible and said, I I've been reading through the Bible like you told me, and, and I just read that the Word is living and active. You knew all along that the Bible contained God's power and that the Koran was a book like any other book. I never had a chance. And the believer said, well, now, do you hate me for life? And he said, oh, no, no, I, I love you. But the contest was unfair, and you knew it. It is unfair, yes. The Word of God is powerful. And I think that if we understand the nature of the Word of God and the power of the Word of God, we must understand the importance of the Word of God. And we must not neglect it, because if we do, we will miss the feeding that God wants to give us, the filling of our heart that comes through the Word of God. But notice also a full heart comes from the work of God. I think it is experienced now, the joy and peace. He says, verse 12, you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. That, that going out, being led forth, I think is a reflection from the Old Testament of the exodus of the Israelites out of Egypt, led out, they're going forth into joy and peace. Also, it is a picture from Isaiah's time of the, of the exiles returning, being led back to the land. And I think it is our story as we're being led from bondage and sadness into joy and satisfaction, led forth kind of out in a triumphal procession, like in the Old Testament, the children of Israel led by the pillar of fire and cloud. We are led by the Holy Spirit in, in that procession of joy. That's our experience now. But notice also, it is something that will be experienced forever. Paul in the New Testament talks about the whole creation groaning. Because of the fall, the creation is marred. And um, maybe COVID-19 tells us that more than anything, something we can't control out there. But that will be changed. That will be made right. The curse will be reversed. And in this text, the creation is re represented by mountains and hills uh, that, that, that burst into song and by trees of the field that clap their hands, all of these things from creation redeemed. And in the end, it's the everlasting sign that will endure forever, God's sign of his transforming power to redeem the world and everyone in them. So yes, this full heart is experienced in this life already, but it will be experienced in much greater significance for all of eternity in his presence. And when we think about these things, all of this should motivate us to seek after a living, loving relationship with this God, to respond to this invitation here, and to allow him to do his work in our lives. The only way we can find satisfaction and joy. One author equated the work of God in our lives to spring cleaning. I'm not sure who this author was, but... Uh, I think she lived in South Dakota. She said, there are hidden corners in my life so out of sight that I don't even have to worry about them when I clean up before company comes. Not even the most fastidious, nosy guest will check out those niches for dust, for fluff balls which accumulate out of the thin air of day-to-day -day living. I live with this mess on the edges knowing it is possible on a rainy day or a procrastinating day to get at it, straighten things up a bit, but all of a sudden, quite out of my schedule, God comes bustling through. Dust rag, mop, less toil, pail of water in hand, and scours and sweeps and shakes and rubs away all those hidden corners. Then, apparently enthused with the results, God goes wild and soaps me down completely, uses a tough bristled brush, tosses pails of water at me to rinse me off and hangs me up to dry, dangling me on the clothesline with two tough clothes pins and hanging there I am like the smell of fresh sheets or fluffy towels blowing on the spring day in South Dakota when there is still snow in the corners of the garden then cod comes back unpins me and lets me loose again it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God but it is a satisfying thing and so my challenge to you this morning would you come as he invites us to? Come to him whether for the first time or again, realizing that only a life devoted to Christ will bring satisfaction. Everything else leads to disappointment. 
because when we come to him our souls are fed our sins are forgiven our hearts are filled will you pray with me father thank you so much for the the good news and the wonderful invitation that when we come to you you in your marvelous grace give us all of the blessings that our hearts and souls learn after yearn after and the result lord is this tremendous joy and peace and satisfaction lord in this disappointing world help us to sense the wonder of all of the blessings you give us i pray in jesus name amen praise become your throne we all people sing we give you everything jesus all for you and lord all hail the king all hail the savior jesus the son of god all hail his name, all hail his power, before his feet we fall, as we crown him, Lord of all. As we crown you, Lord, and this is Lord.
I dare not trust the sweetest frame but only trust in Jesus' name. See, my hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus' name. It's in Christ, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak, made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord. He's Lord.
Lord God, we thank you so much for meeting us here today. Thank you for reminding us that you satisfy our desires with good things because you are our good and faithful Father. Help us to live for you this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.